So, um, my name is Yanis Vichachos, and I'm probably one of the people that are less uh, technically knowledgeable uh, around a lot of the things that you guys are working with, because in all like most of you are um, either DevOps people or, or developers, but I don't want to make too many assumptions. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about a topic that probably you have not heard of before, but I think actually Jenkins makes an excellent application for that, and it's something that we're trying to introduce now into a lot of our colleagues um, for the company that I'm working with, which is uh, Novartis, is a pharmaceutical company. I don't know if anybody else, uh, if you can raise your hand if you're working for a biotech, pharma, or anything like that. Okay, a few of you maybe. Um, so, I'm going to talk about how we have used Jenkins actually as a platform for uh, data processing and uh, analysis uh, for life sciences and uh, hopefully uh, get some ideas from that as to how we can improve the things that we're doing and uh, perhaps give you some interesting use into the tool that a lot of you are using uh, day to day in your in your life, but you have not used it uh, in, in the way that we have applied it. So in order to be able to uh, give you a good feeling as to why we're doing these things and, and uh, the, the, the problem we're trying to solve, um, I will talk a little bit about how life sciences uh, actually right now is a computational sciences field. Um, and it depends a lot on being able to do data management, computational analysis and computational modeling just as good as any other science that has been heavily uh, relied on data in the past. Modern laboratory technologies and instrumentation generate data that right now is very large, as you will see, heterogeneous and complex. So scientists in their daily life face challenges on how to deal with this computational complexity. The scientists themselves uh, are focused actually on the biological problem and not many of them want to deal with complex uh, computational uh, challenges and, and, and uh, solutions that we may be able to provide them. And uh, they also have requirements that change frequently and vary from day to day. You have to be agile when you provide to them, otherwise you, you're sort of providing something that they will not need any longer. So the benefits of computational systems that support life sciences come from easy of use, uh, quick implementation, flexibility, and support for a number of um, attributes that are critical in doing uh, life sciences and medical research. And those are the ability to collaborate with other people, uh, transparent access to data and, and processes, automation, what we call reproducible research, being able to reproduce data that other people have um, uh, re uh, generated in the past, as well as open standards that help us uh, work with, with other people. So the outline of my talk is as follows. I'm going to talk to you about specifically a field of science called uh, high content image analysis. And uh, I will introduce that a little bit so that most of you are able to follow exactly the, uh, the problem we're trying to solve. Then I will talk about how we use Jenkins uh, as a scientific data image and processing platform. And the functionality we're able to get out of the standard plugins uh, and how we're able to use uh, Jenkins to provide access for our lab scientists to high performance image analysis. And finally, I will introduce you as to how we're trying to use now Jenkins as a data analytics platform, um, where it needs a little bit more, such as domain-specific plugins and visual visualization, and also talk about some of the pros and cons of using Jenkins in this, in this context, and perhaps uh, get some feedback from you as to how we want to proceed uh, if it's worth it. So, I'm starting here with a uh, few technical terms. One of them is called high throughput screening, or HTS for short. And that is actually a high throughput drug discovery process that is quite uh, widely used in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it quickly uh, 
assays the biological or biochemical activity of a large number of drug-like compounds, chemicals uh, that uh, pharmaceutical companies have access to. And these assays are performed in a, a, a matrix uh, arrays that have dimensions anywhere from 96 to 1536 wells. So each well is a reaction vessel that, that these uh, compounds are tested in. And essentially is used to discover uh, the potential uh, action of new drugs. Okay, that's, that's how companies uh, approach a, a new disease, a new uh, need for uh, medical intervention in terms of screening their vast libraries and finding uh, something that may be a useful drug. And each process requires automation, robotics, miniaturization, computational analysis, um, and relies on this availability of these chemical libraries and what we call targets, which are actually the proteins or other biological molecules that exist uh, in our bodies that we're trying to manipulate through these uh, chemical uh, uh, molecules. All right, so rather than me trying to explain a lot, I'm going to um, try to show you a short video that describes a little bit of the, um, of the process. And I don't have a, a direct input for sound, so I'm going to um, put my mic next to my So hopefully that was a very quick introduction as, you know, to the high throughput technologies. And you probably noticed at one point that uh, uh, my colleague talked about, about how the data management and data processing now is actually the bottleneck for a lot of these discoveries. Um, so the, the one thing that actually uh, I want to point out is that we're still in this particular video and what I talked about, we talked about uh, reactions that are taking place in plates after 1536. Uh, in, in array matrix. However, the ultimate test tube is actually the cell that you see on the, on the screen. And it's, that is, a single cell actually can be treated with, with a chemical, and we can observe uh, very accurately what happens to that cell. So imagine a population of cells that we can grow in the lab, 
and we can imagine uh, how each one of them becomes the reaction vessel. And that is actually the next problem we're trying to solve, and that's the problem I'm going to present to you today. Um, <clears throat> so, the previous uh, screening method was called high throughput screening. The current problem we're trying to address is called high content screening. And essentially, it is based on all the previous automation technologies that I showed you, but now the screening is happening in individual cells which are growing high-density arrays. They treat it with the same chemical compounds. And then we try to uh, analyze what happened to those cells. And the way we do that is by staining them with fluorescent compounds for specific markers in the cell. And then we're taking um, high-resolution images of them under an automated microscope. And now we end up with thousands and thousands of images that we need to uh, process in order to extract phenotypic data about those cells in order to understand how those compounds uh, act on them in a way that, and where, where, whether they are of some um, uh, value as a potential drug target. So in the last uh, three years, and this is an unadapted uh, slide, uh, my group alone has generated 83 terabytes of high content images. Um, and uh, the one important part here is that it took them over one and a half years of actual computational time to process those images in order to get to numerical data that they can analyze downstream. So if we look at this overall um, workflow process, uh, where the high content screen generates the raw data, which are the images, the image processing generates actual measurements of the cells, which then need to be um, analyzed in order to provide us some results. So the bottleneck is actually between going from raw data to measurements. And that was the focus of the work that took on uh, a couple of years ago um, in terms of trying to provide our scientists with some tools that would allow them to quickly process these raw images into, into measurements. So the vision was to actually uh, use the uh, high performance uh, compute cluster that uh, Novartis has available. Uh, and be able to supplement that with a number of uh, open source tools um, in, in an environment that the lab scientists themselves, without a lot of technical knowledge, could, uh, could use. So, in the process, what we came down to was using three basic tools. The one is Cell Profiler, which I'll, I'll talk very briefly about, which is an image processing software, open source, Jenkins which is the tool that actually tie all these uh, tools and processes together, and uh, of course Linux for, for, the, um, for paralyzing a lot of the image processing um, jobs that we talked about. So Cell Profiler is an open source uh, uh, software that has been developed actually in town here at the Broad Institute, which is part of the Harvard MIT. Uh, it itself is a platform independent software written in Python, uh, it uh, has two different forms. The one is a desktop client that the lab scientists themselves can use to create a image processing pipeline using a variety of pre-made modules. And uh, importantly for us in order to, to create a high throughput uh, process for this is these, uh, the, the ability to run a cell profiler uh, uh, from the command line on the Linux cluster. So it has a headless mode uh, and therefore is suitable for deployment on, on uh, then it's grid engine and can process very large numbers of, of images. So if you look here at the user interface of, of uh, Cell Profiler, uh, on the left hand side you will see that there is a, a number of modules that you string together. Um, and on the right hand side, each module as you will select it, it has a number of, of details that you will select in order to, to configure the parameters for that particular image, uh, uh, image processing step that you want. And then, of course, you have a number of tools for adding new modules into your uh, system. So at the end, you, uh, you are able to test with a few uh, images on your desktop to see how well your uh, image processing analysis proceeds, whether you can segment the objects on the images, identify the things that you're interested in. And then, pretty much, now you have a nice uh, pipeline that's transferable to the Linux cluster where we can process the images. Um, up to that point, the process was essentially limited to a few used, uh, uh, technical people in, in our um, 
scientific operations group, that they were able to run software pilot on the cluster with this very large number of images. And the goal was to provide them with an environment where we could do that uh, without involving a, a, um, a person from the uh, uh, scientific operations, but uh, rather uh, have them do it themselves. And uh, the tool that essentially we used was, was Jenkins. So Jenkins is very good for uh, gluing things together uh, and is, as I'll show you, not just a tool for, for building software, you can do a lot of other things. Very good for quick prototyping. Uh, perhaps the user interfaces that we're able to build are not uh, the nicest ones, but they are, uh, they are functional, and uh, therefore this tool has uh, turned out to be incredibly useful. So Jenkins allows us to very rapidly wrap any command line script or program in a web interface. It has excellent support for Groovy, which is a Java-based uh, dynamic water scripting language. Um, a lot of people can use it, of course, as we've heard uh, from uh, an early result of today, Python is as good as a, a, another scripting language to use. Uh, of course, the broad community support that comes from Jenkins and the over 800 plugins that are available. And uh, of course, Jenkins provides us with a basic workflow and, and web server, and also is used extensively internally in our uh, Niger, uh, Novartis IT group for building all kinds of internal software. And as I will show you, Jenkins is now also emerging as a useful biomatic tools and uh, tool. And for some of those of you that may be uh, aware, there is a project called the BioUno uh, project that I'm going to refer to a couple uh, times in this talk. It has been very critical in supporting me in what I'm doing. And very recently, I also uh, joined this project. So this is probably not something I need to explain to, to many of you here, but uh, I always put you know, sort of this simplistic block diagram of, of how Jenkins uh, sort of works and how it interacts with its uh, remote uh, and, and local environment. Uh, essentially, we're providing a user interface. We always work with uh, parameterized builds, freestyle builds. Um, and uh, the Jenkins uh, plugins, uh, a critical plugin for us is the SSH plugin that communicates with the Linux cluster. And uh, this way, we're able to uh, execute a number of the remote scripts as well as uh, the self-profiler application. So for our users, there is uh, essentially a four-step process that uh, they were able to uh, grasp uh, quite uh, easily and, and, and follow. It consists of basically three Jenkins steps, and after that, essentially, they're, they're ready to uh, retrieve their data and use uh, downstream analysis tools um, to look at them. But basically, uh, at the beginning, they will take one of those pipelines that I showed you the cell profiler can generate on, on their desktop, um, and they will uh, send it to Jenkins. This has turned out to be a powerful way of us to collaborate. Uh, these, these pipelines, when they upload it to Jenkins, they are parsed for a number of important metadata. And also during the build, we're collecting a bunch of annotation from the person who's contributing this pipeline. So now these pipelines exist as a library on the Jenkins server. And as, as I will show you in the downstream step, the person can come into the server and select any of those pre-existing pipelines, either to use it directly on the cluster or download it to their own desktop again and modify it, reuse it, and, and uh, come up with perhaps a different variation. So that has turned out to be an extremely useful part of, of how we use Jenkins. Um, the other part is uh, where we need to create these specific image lists that uh, self propeller will process. These image lists contain a number of instrument metadata that exists in a variety of XML and other sort of instrument attached files. And so we've written some Ruby scripts that are able to parse this metadata from the images and create the correctly formatted list that self profiler is looking for in order to process it. And finally, uh, there's a third step where uh, the two parts, the image list and the imaging pipeline come together, and the user simply says, I want this image list with this pipeline uh, to be processed. And that's all they need to do on, on, a, on a Jenkins job. They bring those two together, they click a build button, and off it goes to the cluster where the images are, are processed um, the measurements are um, generated. 
Finally, uh, as I will show you, there is a step where you know, they're able to retrieve the data. Um, and just as important, um, they're able to delete data. Um, you may not think that this is a good idea, but um, especially uh, since they're doing a lot of asset development, some of the data is not necessarily used for long-term uh, studies or storage or whatever, uh, but they still occupy very large amounts of, of disk space. Using the associated files plugin, which perhaps some of you are, uh, have used, that's a very useful plugin. Not only gives them a link to where the data is, but it also allows them once they delete it built for all of these data to be deleted. Because that data, we do not keep it on the archive workspace of, of Jenkins, but rather we have it on some um, shared um, network uh, disk space. Um, and so, if you delete a build, it does not necessarily get uh, deleted unless you have the associated plugin, associated files plugin that uh, allows you to also delete this data. So that's has been very useful. So in terms of the high-level components, we provide them with what you probably recognize as a as a standard Jenkins, but you know we're kind of trying to make it uh, look a little bit more user friendly for the lab scientists. We put a few uh, pictures there using embedded um, uh, HTML into the descriptions of either the project or the, um, uh, uh, the, the views or the project. Uh, there is a launch pad, essentially a, a build form for each one of the jobs that they will perform. And finally, we also use the build pipeline uh, plugin that allows them to sort of um, visually uh, track uh, the, the workflow uh, through its, it, it, its build. As you see, in this particular uh, workflow, we might have up to four uh, different build steps. Some of them are taking place in the cluster. Some of them are taking place in the Jenkins server. But at any rate, this is a very useful plugin that allows them to, to monitor uh, easily the progress and the outcome of their, of their builds. So I'm going to walk you into a little bit more detail uh, through the, the steps. And, and show you a little bit of the, of the UI we developed for them. Uh, the first, of course, is, as I said, the ability for them to contribute the pipeline. So if you look on this, um, on this form, you will see here that uh, essentially the top part of the form is just for collecting user annotation about this pipeline. Remember the purpose of contributing, of, of, of uploading this file to, um, to Jenkins is so that it can get reviewed by other people. So we're trying to collect information from them as to you know how they're using it uh, and uh, you know what is important about this pipeline, this image processing pipeline. And um, then they will take the pipeline file and they will upload it. So the outcome of that is that pipeline actually now the pipeline file itself gets moved on to the Jenkins. It's, get, it's getting archived as part of the build. And uh, in addition, we'll take the file as it gets uploaded and parse it itself. So we will extract additional information about how the data is processed that the, the user itself does not have to provide, right? Because users hate putting in information in the common data menus. So at the end, we're using the summary display plugin, which allows for a kind of consistent and nice view of, of uh, various things that we want to display to them. And in addition to the descriptive information that they entered themselves, we will pull out information out of the pipeline itself and we'll display the different uh, tabs onto the, uh, using the, the summary display plugin. So this way somebody can go onto the Jenkins, uh, browse through the builds and uh, I identify the pipeline and find a lot more information before they, they can they Importantly, they can download it as a built artifact, as you all know, and it can be used directly on the desktop version of Cell Profiler. Cell Profiler itself has its uh, good um, uh, input-out capabilities for these pipelines for the URL. So all we do is we, we copy the URL from the Jenkins for the artifact, we plug it into the, into the Cell Profiler on the desktop, and immediately they have a pipeline onto their desktop to use. Now I will go through two or three slides where I'm going to show you in a little bit more detail how we use the SSH plugin to execute runs on the cluster. 
Um, as I said, the software that actually runs on the cluster is self profiler itself, but everything else is managed on the Jenkins server. So this is the form that the user will, will use to launch one of those um, uh, job arrays on the cluster. They will annotate, as we ask them usually to annotate, and then they will uh, select a processing pipeline in an image list. As I told you before, both of those now exist on the Jenkins server. So the type of parameter that's used in, in those drop-down boxes is the run type parameter, right? So that is essentially looking into any other Jenkins project to pull in one of the Jenkins uh, uh, previous builds and associate it with, with this build. So um, the job that we'll execute on the cluster brings together the image and pipeline and the image list and um, the next step I'm showing you here from the configuration file, essentially uh, we use um, a Groovy to write the job array jobs that will run on the cluster. Uh, that creates a uh, launch uh, shell script uh, and is right now located on the Jenkins server. The next thing is using at the bottom here, as you see, the uh, SSH plugin, which runs a few commands using uh, parameters that come from the Jenkins environment. So it will set up the data structure environment that we need on the cluster. Then it will actually take this batch file that was created on, on, on Jenkins and uh, it will download it onto the cluster. And this is where the uh, web server uh, capability of Jenkins is, is a wonderful thing to have. You don't have to, to copy, you don't have to do any of that. You simply uh, use wget to get the files that you need from, from the Jenkins server. You bring them to the cluster and uh, you say Q sub and off you go. All of the job arrays now start executing on, on the cluster. Well, what's left for the user to do? The user now wants to see how things are going on the cluster. So monitoring and perhaps error recovery and finally seeing where the, their data stands. So we have a, um, uh, on, as a project description, we provide some hyperlinks that when you click them, actually they take them to a build pipeline view of the uh, cluster runs. So they can see each one of the individual steps, um, actually not steps, but rather jobs that are running um, on the cluster. Um, and of course, as you know, if you can use the build pipeline uh, plugin, green means good, Red means something went wrong, yellow means in process, and blue means that it has been interrupted. When you click on the console of the monitoring um, job, what we show them is a graphical output from the cluster that actually counts the number of files that the uh, output of cell profile generates. And that usually is one to one against the images that they were generated. So, you know, this way we can actually track and create a kind of a pseudo progress bar that is pretty cheap to produce without, uh, you know, too much heavy engineering. Finally, once all of these things are, are finished, um, we use the, uh, as I said, the associated files plugin and the HTML publisher plugins from, from Jenkins to provide them with some uh, relatively simple but quite powerful reports to find their data from where they can download it and use it for downstream analysis. Um, so the report itself contains a number of um, what we call analysis provenance links. Basically, they can click on those things and go back to understand how they, they made their, their um, execution on the cluster, what parameters they use, what pipeline they use, what images they use, and so on. And of course, um, we also give them a kind of a quick visual QC feedback by changing the color of this uh, bar at the bottom from yellow when things are running to, to green when it's done. This is a, a uh, additional pipeline that we're using to provide them with a visual QC of the uh, images that the Microsoft has generated. As you see here, there's an array of thumbnails. Each one of those uh, uh, thumbnails itself comes from a, a 2,000 by 2,000 um, high-resolution picture that the microscope has uh, has uh, received. 
uh, Jenkins will run through a, a rather complicated workflow to not only generate the image list, but also, if they want to, um, run a self-profiler in the background and generate these, these thumbnails from the full-size images and assemble them into this, uh, into this array that they can use for QC purposes. And they can click on any one of them and they can go to the full-size images as shown here. Um, an important part of when you're doing image analysis is to find the right parameters that provide you the optimal um, segmentation, as you call, of the, of the objects, right? The objects in this particular case are cells. So the little squiggles that you see on those pictures are actually cells as they've been photographed on, on the array where they've grown. So right now we have actually also provided a Jenkins workflow that allows them to um, run these jobs in parallel and, and uh, provide uh, a range of parameters in an Excel spreadsheet that then creates this report that you see here where they can visually understand how the segmentation of those images worked. Right? So you can see here, for example, that this, this third column, and you can't read the parameters at the bottom, but those are the parameters of, of, of the particular modules that they're testing. It did not produce very good segmentation. And you see here in the middle that there is uh, sort of a blank uh, segmentation. And over here, it wasn't able to segment it because you see this, this large blue continuum here where there should be many individual project, uh, cells. So probably the parameters uh, in this uh, group of, um, of the modules is the best for doing segmentation in this particular case. So to finish up this talk, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how now we are moving um, to the next step, we're taking these uh, measurements from the images um, and we're trying to analyze it again on, on Jenkins. Um, of course, this is how now we're realizing that uh, we're suffering uh, because all those hundreds and hundreds of plugins uh, are very limited in terms of the kind of things that we can do uh, in terms of, uh, of analytics on, on Jenkins. But there are a few uh, good plugins that I'm going to point out that they're certainly you know, helping a lot and more and more are, are developed now. So my colleagues provided me with this workflow and said, you know, this is what we actually want to do with the data. Now this workflow is a little challenging, not because of the individual steps themselves, but because at each one of those steps, there is a required user interaction with, with the job. Okay? The user needs to select parameters in order to do the analysis the optimal way. Some of the, the data sets, uh, and this is one of the challenges with high content screening, is that you don't have a defined schema for those. The data itself varies from run to run. Depending on the modules that you use, you get different types of measurements, and the measurements actually are multi-parametric. So for one cell, you can get up to 600 different parameters that are measured on that cell, depending on the modules that you're using. So I can't quite a priori define what those parameters are and know exactly what my data structure is. Therefore, I need to be able to adapt from run to run uh, on, on how the people are going to analyze the data. Therefore, I need to uh, have the ability to provide them with dynamic metadata around their analysis and their metadata, and they make selections as to what they want to, to, um, uh, to analyze. So, the plugins that we're using in this, in this case are the following. And those were already pre-existing. These are some of the pre-existing plugins. The R plugin comes actually from the BioInno project, has been contributed to the Jenkins community, is a fabulous analytics plugin. Very simple. You throw R code at it, and it will run it, and it will generate uh, tons and tons of, of graphics that R is able to generate. So that's number one. What do you do with those graphics? Well, you want to be able to see them in an organized way. Image gallery plugin, also uh, contributed by the BioUno project. Okay, very nice. You can you can look at your at your uh, at your uh, R output, uh, PNGs, JPEGs, whatever it is, and you can also go through them one by one if you want. Finally, other reporting plugins, the summary plugin, as the XML summary plugin that I showed you earlier with a tabbed output, as well as the HTML publisher plugin. 
So, using Jenkins for interactive analytics, what are the opportunities we have here? We have the ability to quickly prototype this functional analysis for this multi-parametric data. That very quickly, as we have found out, improves our ability to define the analytic requirements. Um, it also allows us to quickly experiment with the analysis workflow, what kind of things we want to change together in order to be able to produce the, uh, the types of, of analysis and, and uh, QC that we need. Also, now, people are already used to Jenkins for running various jobs on the cluster and so on, and therefore, it uh, already provides them with an easy entry into the next level of analytics. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we're also facing some challenges. And the first challenge is the limitations of the standard Jenkins user interface. The primary challenge that we faced was the interaction uh, and dy dynamic uh, ability of a lot of the controls that we have on the Jenkins user interface. We have choice controls that you define into your configuration. We have perhaps the extended choice uh, control that you can actually point to a properties file. In all of those cases, you still get a stack. You have to know exactly where you get the data from. You cannot dynamically redirect to different places to look at data. Also, what we're uh, not very good at is uh, updating a control on the Jenkins uh, build form uh, from selections we're making from another control. Typically to what you, you're accustomed to what you're using with a database form, right? You select one field as a cascading uh, chains and so on and so on, and that is actually very difficult to do on Jenkins, if not impossible. Again, the other uh, challenge was the high content data schema that I mentioned earlier. So this is where my uh, collaboration with the BioUnit project started. Uh, uh, they were already working on all these nice uh, plugins for, for Jenkins for bioinformatics, and I approached them and said, can you do something about this? You know, I have all these different choice controls, but I want just one that we can combine all these capabilities of some of these, and I gave them a whole bunch of requirements, and they said, sure. Within action, probably a week, we already had a working prototype. And I said, well, why don't you call it Uno Choice? Okay, no, because I want to collect everything into one control, plus the project is called Bio Uno. So there it goes, it's our Bio Uno, Uno Choice plugin. So I'm going to describe to you in a little detail what this plugin does because I think it does a lot of things. First of all, it allows you to provide a choice list that is dynamically generated. You can use a Groovy script to do that. And that has not been the first time that I think a dynamic parameter plugin also does that. However, now you can use it for cascade parameters. And it references one or more other UI parameters that we can use in the Groovy script. And it dynamically refreshes when any of those reference UI parameters change. So in this case, if I change um, you know, my parameter up here, these parameters will change. As I started using it, I realized many times what I really need when I'm doing an analysis is actually to look at some data that's coming from a previous step. So I said, I'm going to call this a reference parameter. It's not a parameter that takes part in the build, but it's a parameter that you refer to in order to set up a parameter on the build. So now, one of choice also provides you the ability to generate dynamic um, reference parameters. These show up on the Jenkins form, built form, as HTML. Uh, and in this particular case, for example, I have an example where they're showing up as uh, hyperlinks to previous projects. Let me see if this is going to work. I have an instance of Jenkins running on Amazon Cloud. And I'm going to show you an example where actually Works. All right, so the, what you see here is a chemical structure coming from the NCBI uh, database. Uh, that's the National Center for Bioinformatics uh, in, in the United States. Now, this is actually rendered on the Jenkins form 
by a Uno choice uh, reference parameter. And I can use the dynamic capability that I have to select another structure, another structure, and so on. Right? So this is still the build form. It's not a, uh, uh, a builder report. It's the build form. So looking at some of these data, I can make a choice, and I, I can, I can um, uh, therefore um, set my own parameters. So here's some of the analytics we're doing now using the R plugin, where we can uh, generate some, uh, look at the SRE response to across the control of plates. We can generate heat maps uh, of the data that we can um, look at. And I'm going to skip this slide. And so I am soon releasing a number of uh, high content screening analytics uh, to my colleagues for initial testing. And hopefully these things work out. We're going to also release them as part of the bio Uno project. Now, the things that are challenges for Jenkins, I want to close, presenting some of those, because hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, address some of those and get some, some feedback. Starting with the word artifact. If you look at the, at, the, <laughs> uh, at the dictionary, there are two definitions. The one that we as developers use, and that's any object that's made by somebody, which turns out to have a terrible connotation in, in this life sciences field, because an artifact is a spurious observation or result that most people try to avoid. Right? So we have already kind of a few mismatch here. So when we're trying to, to teach people how to use Jenkins, uh, you know, there's the vocabulary, and then there's also sort of this developer-centric view that Jenkins has adopted so far, and it makes it a little bit challenging. So I would say, you know, we need to do some improvements in the Jenkins uh, user interface so we can perhaps remove or at least hide some of the um, um, developer-centric uh, things that are there. And uh, as uh, Koshin Kate talked about this morning, this is actually now a very active discussion in the uh, Jenkins community and, and uh, around how we're going to refresh the, uh, the Jenkins UI. I think we're also missing a lot of the graphical uh, configuration um, uh, viewers that some of the other um, things have. Uh, something that is close and dear to my heart is metadata, and that's annotations. And uh, so those, we need to be able to introduce them into our Jenkins builds, and not only that, but also be able to search on those. And finally, life science domain plugins. Uh, those are up and coming now with the, with the BioUno project, but we're going to need a lot more of them. So in summary, we have demonstrated that Jenkins can be used for life science applications. We have observed that the scientists themselves are able to be willing to use the platform despite its domain and business mismatch. And there is some fundamental interest in the larger Jenkins community, I think, to expand the boundaries of the framework beyond continuous integration, and hopefully we'll be taking advantage of that. And uh, some acknowledgments from my Novartis colleagues and the BioWino project, and of course the Jenkins community for uh, giving us the opportunity to have such a wonderful uh, tool in our hands and the many, many plugins that come with it. Thank you very much. Thank you.